Good morning, and welcome to our virtual panel discussion on innovation in the healthcare space, the role that intellectual property plays in that innovation, and how that innovation is being used to help us deal with the COVID-19 pandemic. Of course, when you're discussing new solutions to unmet healthcare needs like COVID-19, a very important role is played by governmental approval agencies like the FDA. So we will be discussing the implications of that role in our conversation as well. The unfortunate social impact of COVID-19 prevents us from sitting down together and having an interactional panel discussion. Instead, we have created a panel program with three distinct but related presentations from industry experts in the healthcare sector. The first presentation will be by Dr. Myla Lai Goldman, founder and executive chairperson of Gene Centric Therapeutics. Gene Centric is a new company with a proprietary platform designed to identify drug responder populations that enable the development of precision cancer drugs while improving patient outcomes. Given the diagnostic focus of Gene Centric, Dr. Lai Goldman is going to explain the important role diagnostics has in treating patients by sharing Gene Centric's story. The important impact that IP has played and is playing in Gene Centric's success and then talk about the need for diagnostics when trying to address a new disease like COVID-19. Of particular interest, Dr. Lai Goldman will share some patenting challenges diagnostic companies face due to somewhat recent and unfortunate Supreme Court case law that concerns what is patentable under Section 101. Thank you for including me um, on today's panel, and especially thank you for including diagnostics as part of the panel. Just as a brief Brief background, I'm a pathologist. I've spent about 30 years of my career in varying roles, um, developing and implementing novel diagnostics. Um, I spent the majority of them at LabCorp, 18 years, um, the last 10 as chief medical and chief science officer. But for the last 10 years, I've been a venture partner at Hatteras Venture Partners. And I co-founded um, a company called Gene Centric Therapeutics, um, which is what I'm going to introduce you to today. So you may first be asking, uh, didn't she just say she was a diagnostics person, but she founded a therapeutics company? Um, well, Gene Centric actually started out as a diagnostics company. It started out as Gene Centric Diagnostics, um, but we uh, changed the name of the company to Gene Centric Therapeutics. Um, and part of that was because we really not a never have been a traditional diagnostics company. Um, traditional diagnostic companies, they make uh, kits, uh, in vitro diagnostics, um, or they may be a clinical laboratory. Uh, we've never been either of those. Um, we're primarily more of an informatics company. But, you know, there's also um, another reason why we changed our name. And that really has to do with uh, value proposition. And reality is uh, therapeutics are more often valued uh, more than diagnostics. And when you need to raise money, that winds up being an issue. And a, a bit for today's um, discussion is IP is really quite a component of that value proposition. So, um, but for now, let me tell you a bit more about Gene Centric. Um, this is going to be a really brief intro, um, only about uh, 10 minutes. Um, and if anybody is really interested in hearing more, getting more details, or has any ideas for us, please feel free to contact me um, afterwards. So, a bit more about Gene Centric. Um, it's a spin out of the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, and it was co-founded by myself and Dr. Chuck Brew, who you see on the screen, and Dr. Neil Hayes. And they were really um, in the forefront of um, using RNA-based um, testing to understand cancer biology. And so I'm going to tell you a bit more about, about that later, but um, what we... Um, what we did first was in license from University of North Carolina, a uh, 52 gene gene expression signature that is able to define some very important clinically relevant subtypes of lung cancer. So the absolute foundation of gene centric 
is the in licensing of, um, of IP uh, from the university. And we did that through a license program where we needed to commit to continuing the IP, prosecuting the patent, um, but also towards developing um, the technology um, into an adoptable diagnostic. So um, what makes an adoptable diagnostic? Um, well, this is actually something I've studied for many years, and this is work that I did um, when I was at LabCorp. We're really understanding what you need to do to advance a discovery and innovation into something that can be used by the patient. And there are, you can see three phases in the adoption curve. And in the early development phase, what you're doing is you're, you're, you're developing the assay so that it works all the time the same way. Um, it's reproducible. You're also associating it with the disease. But in order to get it adopted, and you can see that really steep curve there, you really need to do a third, a third activity, and that's called demonstrating clinical utility. So it's not enough to just analytically validate it and clinically validate it. You have to show that if you use the test, it's actually gonna change the outcome of the patient. Why do I mention um, all of these details about it? It's because the reality is this costs money to do. So in order to bring a technology really forward, what you're needing to do is raise funds. And in GeneCentric's case, we raised funds from Hatteras Venture Partners and from LabCorp. But a fundamental important component of being able to raise these funds is the license for the intellectual property. And in our case, this was an exclusive license so that only we would be able to offer this technology. And um, a couple of things about this first license that we took, it's now is a test um, offered by LabCorp called Histoplus. And, um, and it really was the foundation of, of GeneCentric. Okay, well, we founded the company in 2011 I said there, it takes more than at least five years to develop a technology into an adoptable diagnostic. It's 2020, um, where, where are we now in terms of the company? Well, a little bit of background before I tell you what, we, what we're up to. Um, the field has really grown in the last 10 years. Um, and a lot of the precision medicine field that I'm addressing. And this is the field that really tries to get the right medicine to the right patient, at the right time. It really grew up around the testing of DNA and DNA mutations in cancer. Um, and this is the matching of certain mutations to certain targeted drugs. What you can see on this slide is that many patients don't have a targetable mutation. So it's only a certain subset of patients that are even have the possibility of getting one of these targeted drugs. But even if patients have the mutation and a drug available to them, the drug doesn't always work, or if initially works, it's not a durable response. Another component of this is that um, some patients who don't have the mutation respond to the drug. So something else is going on here. Gene-centric has taken a different approach. And as I mentioned, we are an R RNA um, testing company. Our, our work is all based, not on as so much on DNA, but on RNA. Because um, as I mentioned, something must be going on beyond just the DNA mutations for some of these patients to respond. Um, for by analyzing RNA, we know that these some of these mutations are actually transcribed into the RNA. And what we believe the RNA is telling us more about is actually what's going on biologically in the patient. Okay. So in those 10 years, since we initially um, licensed our first license, um, much has happened 
many, many companies are actually sequencing DNA. They're sequencing RNA. What's different about us is we actually understand how to analyze that RNA data into, into meaningful information for the patient. And what we're able to do is develop multi-gene using many gene signatures that we believe can um, analyze more what, what's going on in the patient and better able to indicate what drugs are really going to work. Now, I mentioned what we did with our first in-licensed assay, but what we've done in, um, more recently is be able to take this informatics platform and tremendous informatics skill and develop two lines of business. Our first line of business is that we're developed many um, pharmaceutical and biotech partnerships and service and deliver, where we're delivering services. And what we do is actually helping them understand better who their drugs are likely to work for, help them um, with their clinical trials. And in many of these companies, we're on the seventh and eighth project. Um, and um, we have though a second line of activity as well, where we've taken all this information that we've learned from either what we've licensed or what we've developed and develop these gene signatures. And now we're moving them into something that's called a companion diagnostic. And that would be a test that would be needed um, in order to give certain drugs. And these may be drugs that are from one of our pharmaceutical partners, but we've also developed our own insights into drugs that we're looking to develop ourselves. Thus, we started out as gene-centric diagnostics, and now we've really evolved in terms of being gene-centric um, therapeutics. And um, in all of this and uh, um, avenue of direction of gene-centric, IP has been just a central component. It's important to the company, it's important to our investors. In many cases, it's also important uh, for developing the many partnerships that, that we've been able to do over the past 10 years. Thank you. Thank you, Myla. Your journey with GeneCentric is a very interesting story, and we appreciate your sharing of the challenges you have faced in developing these potentially life-changing diagnostics. I was wondering if you could share a bit more on how IP helped you get your company started, particularly concerning your ability to raise financial support. Um, as I mentioned, um, GeneCentric was, was founded by executing a Carolina Express license with the U University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, Lineberger Cancer Center. And the foundation of the company was, bring, was the IP. That's why the company was formed. And um, then of course, we as a company had to commit towards continuing the, to prosecute the patent and to developing it um, into something that would be clinically useful for the patient. So without IP, we wouldn't have had a company. Uh, it really is the foundation of it. And it was very important to our initial investors. Um, that was step one. Uh, before they would invest in the company was seeing that we could secure the license. Um, and, um, you know, you really, though, bring up a question that's, um, that's really fundamental, not only to, to gene-centric, but um, really to, um, to all of diagnostics. Because, you know, funding is highly dependent on um, availability of patent protection. And there have been, um, I guess it's about 10 years, um, you know, uh, Supreme Court rulings that um, really impacted the patentability of biotech, namely diagnostics. And it's become, it became really challenging, it become really challenging. And um, it, these challenges impacted our ability to get funded um, or if, or, and um, cost us a lot of money in order to, um, uh, to prosecute the patents and to get claims 
that that are useful, um, you know, for the company. And part of this was actually why we changed the name of the company um, uh, from gene centric diagnostics to gene centric therapeutics, because frankly, there were some investors who would hear the term diagnostics in your name and say, no, nope, you're a diagnostic company. We're not investing in diagnostics. Now, I don't want to say that patents are the only reason why it had been challenging to um, get investments in diagnostics. There, there are other challenges. Um, you have um, challenges in getting in reimbursement, um, getting paid, how much you get paid. Um, you have and you have to really meet the challenge if you bring a test to giving access, you know, to all patients and, and access um, is a challenge for diagnostics. It may involve business practices and, um, that, that really are challenging to do within the reimbursement environment. But really fundamentally, um, patents are a really important component and, um, in terms of getting funded and, and have, have been a factor in the challenges that many diagnostic companies have faced um, when they've tried to, to uh, raise funds. And um, for Gene Centric, I mean, we started with one patent that we in license. And over the last 10 years, we've, um, we've in licensed additional IP from UNC and um, as well as developing and co-developing with UNC um, sig significantly more IP. So we, we really have a patent portfolio as a company as well. And, um, you know, I've, I've mentioned before some of the challenges um, with IP and diagnostics. And um, I do want to mention that um, recently, there has been some general recognition um, within government and industry that perhaps there needs to be some form of accommodation um, uh, because of the Supreme Court rulings and the um, US Patent Office has provided some um, reasonable guidance um, in terms of how to structure claims. And so Gene Centric and I'm sure others are um, you know, taking in this information and working with their patent attorneys to sort of um, use these guidelines going forward. And, you know, we'll need to see how these, these guidelines hold up, you know, in, um, as, as the patents proceed. But, you know, one thing, one additional thing I'd really like to mention is this really isn't just about gene centric. I think everyone should be concerned about diminished um, investor interest in um, diagnostic innovation and, and, and IP and which, you know, as I've mentioned, has had challenges because of IP. I couldn't say it a better another year. Let's look at 2020. Here came COVID, okay in an environment where for 10 years, diagnostic innovation has really struggled for funding. And the, frankly, it's left us in a year where we are trying to catch up um, in terms of testing. And um, I don't think, if I polled people a year ago and talked about testing, I think I would have gotten a few shrugged shoulders, everybody knows about testing now, okay? You can't have the news where you don't hear about testing. Um, earlier in the year, much of the discussion was we, we just didn't even have a test, you know, for COVID. And it's a new virus, that's not really surprising. But what we've had, you know, since then is focuses on access to testing, on need for accurate testing, um, need for rapid testing. Um, and while you see the labs and the, and the uh, manufacturers trying to ramp everything up in order to meet the need, 
you know, we really don't have the kind of tests we really need, which are something called point of care or, you know, right at, at the bedside or near the patient. And it's not like there isn't technology and innovation out there that couldn't deliver this. There is, but we've been in an environment where it hasn't been the focus of investors to invest in this type of technology, you know? So we're kind of been in this catch up mode. Now, since the spring, the government has put quite a bit of money, I mean, uh, into um, advancing technology uh, to deliver more rapid diagnostics. It's a program called RADIX, called Rapid Acceleration of Diagnostics. And I anticipate there'll be a lot more options you know, out there going forward. Um, but it's been a catch up year. I mean, we've had to develop this as we go. But, you know, in the end, um, you know, I'm always hopeful that um, the new guidelines for uh, the patent office is going to provide a path, you know, a clearer path forward to structuring, you know, some claims, as I've mentioned before because uh, that's a significant part of the value proposition. And, you know, ultimately, um, whether it's a cancer test that GeneCentric offers or a COVID test, innovation in diagnostics is important, you know, really for everyone. The next presenter will be Joaquin DeWatto, who is the vice chairperson at Johnson & Johnson, responsible for both the pharmaceutical and consumer sectors at Johnson & Johnson. I must say one of the special pleasures of my working at J&J &J is getting to interact with Joaquin, and I believe you will understand why after you watch his fantastic presentation. Joaquin will provide insights into the pharmaceutical discovery process and the challenges one faces when developing new therapeutics to address unmet medical needs. Joaquin will then describe the critical role IP has in encouraging and supporting that innovation. Joaquin will also discuss how numerous companies have used IP-protected proprietary products and platforms to attempt very quickly to find solutions for COVID-19. Hello and thank you for having me today. I'm honored to be speaking among such an esteemed panel about the important role IP protections play in advancing pharmaceutical innovation. The coronavirus pandemic has put a magnifying glass on the pharmaceutical industry and force us to think about multiple questions. How can we bring safe and effective vaccines and therapeutics to the public in record time? How can collaboration with the government, academia, and other companies accelerate those efforts? And how do we continue to supply innovative medicines and products that our patients and consumers depend on without interruption. IP has played a pivotal role in helping us answer each of these questions. As the world's largest healthcare company, Johnson & Johnson is well positioned to address the challenges our global community is facing in these unprecedented times. We have a global reach, strong investment in R&D, deep scientific expertise, and extensive partnerships. We also have more than 135,000 employees united around our credo, which puts the patient and the consumer at the center of everything we do. And we have been tackling health crises for 134 years. So you can see why we say that our company was built for times like this. Johnson & Johnson has three business segments, pharmaceuticals and consumer, both of which I oversee, and medical devices. IP protections play a critical role across all of our businesses, but I will focus today's conversation on our Janssen pharmaceutical business particularly because it is at the center of our goal to supply 1 billion doses of our investigational vaccine globally once approved. For starters, 
our worldwide R&D investment in Janssen Pharmaceutical Companies is massive. In 2019, we invested 8.8 billion, 91% more than we spent on sales and marketing. This makes Janssen one of the world's top R&D investors in any industry. It also allowed us to advance more than 80 new medicine candidates last year. To succeed in this tremendously difficult area, we could not do it alone. In fact, we have more than 140 active collaborations with universities, biotech companies, and others. This level of R&D investment and collaboration simply would not be possible without IP. Now that you know a little more about our approach, I want to talk about IP's important role for the pharmaceutical space more broadly. The reason we invest so much in R&D and partnership is that pharmaceutical research is an incredibly risky endeavor. There are high development costs, failure rates, and regulatory requirements. Even with the best science, this process is not straightforward. First, pharmaceutical companies must go through rigorous clinical trials, which is unique to our industry. Our products must be proven safe and effective before they are approved for use. This means that millions of compounds may be screened, developed, or tested for each medicine that meets these standards. And consequently, companies often invest tens or even hundreds of millions of dollars on products that failed to reach the market. Second, the costs associated with this process have risen significantly. Over the past five years, Janssen invested more than 34 billion in R&D, and we have had seven new medicines approved during that time. It is a risky undertaking that only increases as we try to tackle more difficult diseases. Without reliable IP protections and the predictability they provide, pharmaceutical and biotech companies would not be able to take on this type of risks and to make the continued investment required to develop new medicines. And the remarkable new breakthroughs we have seen over the last several years, including the existing work to fight COVID-19, simply would not exist. The reliable USIP system is one of the key reasons why more medicines are developed in America than in the rest of the world combined. That said, many people ask me whether IP protections are part of the reason US prices are higher than those of other countries. And the short answer is no. Beyond promoting innovation, IP protections are actually key to keeping costs down over the long term. IP protections provide drug makers exclusivity during a defined period of time, but after they expire, competitors develop generic products and don't have to repeat costly clinical trials. This and the fact that consumers have more drugs to choose from creates affordability. Now that you are experts in pharmaceutical IP, I'm sure you are eager to hear more about the topic that has dominated the zeitgeist, the coronavirus pandemic and a potential vaccine. IP protections are an essential component in the fight against the coronavirus. We have been able to respond quickly to this crisis because we use our proprietary ADVAC technology, which was developed over many years with the support of the IP system. The ability to leverage and build upon scientific research conducted over many years and made possible by the IP system is part of the reason the pharmaceutical industry has been able to expedite the vaccine clinical development process. As I mentioned before, more new medicines are developed in the US than in the rest of the world combined. So I don't think it is purely coincidental that most of the leading companies in the effort to develop a coronavirus vaccine are US-based. First, IP protections have ensured that companies like ours have the resources they need to invest 
in a coronavirus vaccine without delay. Companies have spent billions of dollars on developing a vaccine beyond the support received from governments or philanthropic organizations. Part of the reason we have been able to potentially compress the timeline needed to bring our investigational vaccine candidate to market is that companies like ours are manufacturing at risk. This means we are producing doses before we know whether the product works. Second, having IP protection has long fostered collaboration between biotechnology companies, pharmaceutical innovators, governments, universities, and other research partners, because it allows inventors to realize a fair return for the value their discoveries provide to society. That collaboration has been critical to accelerating our industry's efforts to advance a coronavirus vaccine. As you may have seen earlier, we partnered with the US government to fund the clinical studies of our investigational vaccine. Though we use our own money to make the at-risk manufacturing investment. Finally, IP has played a critical role in ensuring we are able to provide an affordable investigational COVID-19 vaccine once it has been deemed safe and effective and approved by regulators. Johnson & Johnson made a commitment to supply our investigational coronavirus vaccine at a non-for-profit price during the pandemic period. We could only deliver on a commitment like this because of the protection we have for our medicines and other products. Thanks to IP protections, we have the resources and the conditions needed to see these investigational vaccines and treatments through to approval. At Johnson & Johnson, our investigational COVID-19 vaccine is currently being evaluated in the phase three ensemble study. We are committed to achieving the rigorous requirements for research, development, and manufacturing in our efforts to bring a safe and effective investigational COVID-19 vaccine to the public. It is heartening to know that those of you listening to me are aware of the benefits of a robust IP system. I hope that with continued support from the IP community, we can continue to bring innovative therapies, vaccines, and diagnostics to patients around the world. Thank you very much. Thank you, Joaquin. It's always a pleasure to learn from you. I wonder if you can share with us your thoughts on the future of treating the unmet medical needs facing humankind, the difficulty of those challenges, and the role that IP will play in helping you address those challenges. Absolutely, Robert. First, while I'm proud to say that Johnson & Johnson's response to the coronavirus pandemic has been robust and comprehensive, we all know that that isn't the case across the board. We have a lot of work to do, but I believe that the public health sector and the healthcare industry can learn from this time to address existing medical needs and the next great pandemic. Specifically, we will have to prioritize three key areas, pandemic preparation, digitization, and supply resiliency. First, I anticipate that we will see an increased focus in infectious disease treatments and vaccines in years to come from a product development perspective. We need to work proactively to prevent this crisis before they get out of hand. The power of cooperation will be essential in tackling future pandemics and many of the remaining healthcare challenges. In fact, to be prepared for and respond quickly to the next pandemic, we must continue to invest in R&D. And that ongoing investment will only be possible if we preserve the predictable and reliable IP system that we have here in the US. Second, this global crisis has expedited digitization initiatives, or what some call the great acceleration. This crisis has sped up our reliance on our core digital technology capabilities as we work to become more efficient across the board. And I predict that the gains made during this crisis will have an enduring impact on our industry. Lastly, supply resiliency will remain a major focus both for our company and our industry. There are millions of patients and billions of consumers who are counting on our industry supply chain to provide medicines, medical devices, and consumer health products. 
as COVID-19 spread, different parts of Johnson & Johnson supply chain were impacted at different times. This insulated our business from impact and allowed us to apply learnings from one region to another. However, in some places, increased nationalism had governments pushing for manufacturing in country, reinforcing the need for a global supply chain. Now, Johnson & Johnson and the whole biopharmaceutical industry have a long tradition of stepping up in instances of public health emergencies. In fact, we are driven to foster better health for more people in more places. While the world has made significant progress in providing improved health care, major gaps remain and bolder and smarter approaches are needed to overcome the drastic inequity in access to care now. This is why we are putting the world's most vulnerable and underserved at the heart of everything we do, measuring our success in lives improved. For example, for our multi-drug resistant tuberculosis drug, Johnson & Johnson is investing significantly in medical education, pharmacovigilance initiatives, and antibiotic resistant testing and surveillance. We also work with partners to ensure careful distribution. These are activities typically undertaken only by innovator companies. Ultimately, I'm optimistic about what the future has in store for us, and this in many ways is thanks to IP. And then finally, we're going to have Wade Ackerman, a partner at the DC office of the Covington Law Firm and an expert on FDA law and practices. Mr. Ackerman will discuss how the innovation described by Dr. Lai Goldman and Joaquin is presented to the FDA and the role the FDA plays in ensuring that innovation will be safe and effective for the people who would use that innovation. Mr. Ackerman also will describe the current processes being used by the FDA to vet the many proposed treatments for COVID-19. Hi everyone, Wade Ackerman here with Covington. I was excited about the invitation to speak with you today regarding the FDA approval process. As very brief background, I spent a number of years at the FDA's Office of Chief Counsel in DC, and then I served as senior FDA counsel to the Senate Health Education, Labor and Pensions Committee. And that's the Senate committee that has jurisdiction over health, over FDA, and over the Federal Food, Drug and Cosmetic Act. So I always tell people I had the privilege of working with the Senate committee that's the steward of the FDA gold standard. So you can see why I'm excited to, to, today, to today talk to you about the FDA uh, approval process that we've all come to rely on when we reach into our medicine cabinets or go down a pharmacy aisle. Uh, we, we've come accustomed to trusting the drugs that we're taking are safe and effective, but that's not a given. So I wanna share with you a bit about how we got here what the gold standard is and how it's applied by FDA in practice. So let's rewind all the way back to the early part of the 20th century. Patients, doctors, pharmacists, they did not have a consistent way to assess that the medical products they were using were safe, that whether, they were, whether they were effective and of whether they were manufactured in a consistent manner to provide quality and purity. Can you imagine having to look at a capsule in your own home and yourself determining whether it had been manufactured correctly and whether the clinical evidence showed that it worked for the condition you needed it for? But at that time, that's what Americans faced. They were inundated with ineffective and dangerous drugs, medical devices, and adulterated food. And then a tragedy at the turn of the century forced government action. In 1901, 13 children died of tetanus because of the antitoxin they were administered for diphtheria. It was contaminated. And the very next year, Congress reacted. They passed the Biologics Control Act, which gave the federal government its first regulation of vaccine and antitoxin production. And then a few years later, Congress took another transformative step when they enacted the 1906 Pure Food and Drugs Act an expansion of federal government powers to protect patients and consumers. And that law was the birth of the modern FDA. But the 1906 law had limitations. And by the 1930s, there was a growing national outrage in the wake of some egregious examples of products that poisoned, maimed, or killed Americans. The tipping point came in 1937, when more than 100 people, including 34 children, 
died after taking an unsafe drug to treat a variety of ailments, which had been marketed to treat everything from gonorrhea to sore throat. So in 1938, Congress enacted and FDR signed into law the Federal Food Drug and Cosmetic Act. And that law is still FDA's main administrative and regulatory authority today with amendments, of course. The FDCA, as we call it in the FDA bar, required for the first time that drugs must be proven by their manufacturers to be safe before entering the market. And that's the important point, the market entry. And then in the 1960s, another tragedy prompted congressional action again. You probably heard of the drug thalidomide. It was a sedative used to treat morning sickness in pregnant women. And unfortunately it caused serious birth defects in Europe, Canada and other countries around the world. Congress in 1962 added amendments to the FDCA, which were signed into law by President Kennedy. Those amendments, amendments added the efficacy requirement to new drugs. So after 1962, the FDA framework requires manufacturers to prove scientifically before entering the market that a drug is not only safe, but also effective for its intended use. In other words, manufacturers of drugs and devices um, and other medical products have a burden to meet with the FDA before they enter the market. And for drugs, that substantial evidence has to include effectiveness and FDA will, will weigh, for example, whether the benefits of the drug outweigh the risks. And this is what we call the FDA gold standard. The entire world looks to FDA's drug development and approval process as one based on evidence and sound science. And patients, the medical community, families, they trust the safety and efficacy of new drugs and devices in the US, and they have confidence in America's biomedical industry because in part FDA's oversight. If you step back as FDA serves this gatekeeper function, so to speak, before market entry, the regulatory bar requires manufacturers to invest substantial time, expertise, experience, and immense resources in the pursuit of scientific evidence that will support FDA approval. Because without that evidence, FDA would not hesitate as we have seen to deny approval and market entry. So many times generating this substantial evidence for FDA requires two adequate and well-controlled clinical trials. And you've probably heard about that. But the development process starts way before that. On average, it takes um, 10 years or more for early stage R&D to proceed through a product that is approved by FDA for, for, for the market. Companies start by screening, on the drug side at least, companies start by screening thousands of compounds in early stages of the R&D process. The vast majority of those compounds never advance to clinical studies. If a candidate is identified, it must go through a series of testing to provide a preliminary safety assessment before it's ever administered in humans. And then if advanced to clinical trials, there are three phases, which take an average of six to seven years to complete. Phase one is an initial study of safety in a small group of healthy volunteers. Phase two studies safety and efficacy in a relatively small group of patients, usually between 100 and 500 volunteers. And phase three, also known uh, as the pivotal trial, is intended to generate that substantial evidence of safety and efficacy and usually involves thousands of patients across many clinical trial sites. For those not familiar with medical product clinical trials, I want to underscore just how robust uh, these trials are. We're not talking about something a company can outsource and be done in a few weeks and so they can get a, in a race to the market. That, that's not what happens with medical product development. Clinical trials are highly regulated and they're well controlled. They involved detailed protocols, a process to make sure volunteers have informed consent to the process, and a large team of doctors, nurses, and other medical professionals. They conduct the trials over long periods of time. The trials have um, intense documentation requirement, auditing, re auditing requirement, um, maintenance of records requirements, and FDA also performs inspections. Some studies have shown that the average cost for, um, to, to perform FDA quality research and development and bring a successful drug to market is roughly or, or even more than 2.6 billion. And 
And that of course takes into account the R&D that has to happen around compounds that never make it to market. But, but you have to factor that in because a company, a manufacturer has to invest time, resources and expertise in order to discover the, the product that is going to make a difference for patients and, and make it through the FDA review process. So over the years, Congress has provided a number of amendments to the FDCA, but at core, this gold standard has remained in place. I'll, I'll share a personal story from my time at the Senate Health Committee when I was overseeing the FDA portfolio and legislation. Um, at the time, we were working on the 21st Century Cures Act, which is uh, a law that President uh, Obama signed into law in December of 2016. As we considered, um, and it was a bipartisan, bipartisan effort, as we considered amendments to provide some additional flexibility uh, in the R&D and drug and device development process, uh, then FDA Commissioner Margaret Hamburg provided some words of wisdom. I remember it distinctly at one of the hearings. She said, the, the great leaps forward in evidence-based medicine over the last 50 years have come because in part, the high FDA standards for product approval following a series of disasters involving unsafe and ineffective products. Those standards have also boosted the confidence that Americans place in medical products and that the world places in the American biopharmaceutical uh, and device industry. On her, her good advice, Congress found the right balance again um, and, and providing uh, reforms to FDA's um, authorities in the 21st Century Cures Act, but keeping intact the FDA gold standard that has been in place and will remain in place for medical products. I mean, listen, this framework is time consuming and it's costly, there is no doubt. Uh, but Dr. Hamburg and, and um, those others, uh, commissioners before her were right. Um, the, the FDA framework has led to major improvements in public health because of that robust scientific research that comes from the gold standard. It brings us evidence about the safety and efficacy of medical products we use. And without the framework, as history has shown, inadequately tested products will make it onto the market and cause harm to patients. And that itself shows why the investment is worth it. Again, thank you for letting me talk about the FDA process and I look forward to any questions in the, in the rest of the panel. Thank you, Wade. Great presentation, extremely helpful to understand the full picture of healthcare research and development. I was wondering if you could share additional insight on two important COVID-19 questions. First, a lot has been said about the concerns around the safety of vaccines being developed and, as you described, being developed on a very fast schedule. Given your expert understanding of the FDA, do you have any concerns about that agency reducing standards necessary for approval? No, I, I really don't have any concerns on that front. I mean, there's obviously been an incredible amount of attention on the FDA process related to COVID vaccines, as well as other medical products, the therapeutics, the PPE, the testing, uh, diagnostics. Um, for my time at FDA, I can say without a doubt that approval decisions were made by the career scientists and independent of any political interference. And I know it was disheartening to many of us to see the FDA got pulled into a lot of the political discussions around what was a contentious election. But at the same time, you know, if you followed FDA closely, you saw FDA career scientific staff resist any political interference. And um, you, you have seen that um, they've actually put out very transparent scientific standards and have held an advisory committee and are trying to be transparent in the public decision making. There is um, an, actually a process in place for these kinds of emergencies. It's called the Emergency Use Authorization Authority. Um, and again, FDA has set up very clear scientific guidance about the standards it brings to bear in the review. So, um, you know, I, I, I personally know Dr. Peter Marks, who's heading FDA's um, CBER uh, center that has authority over vaccines. And I really have complete confidence that he is going to ensure that appropriate scientific standards are met in, in the tradition of FDA's um, long history. Do you believe the FDA is equipped to handle the pace of innovation on COVID-19 so that we can rely upon a safe and effective vaccine if approved by the FDA? I mean, listen, I, I know the pandemic is a unique moment. It's been really hard for all of us to watch the impacts on families and, and, and people across the country and across the world. And um, obviously it's been devastating on, on other fronts as well. Uh, but this conversation about whether FDA is equipped to handle innovation and the pace of innovation is really not unique to the pan pandemic. It's, it's a perennial conversation and in fact, you know, the 21st Century Cures Act that I mentioned earlier 
was a two-year bipartisan legislative process in Congress that ex examined very deeply FDA's processes and resources, resources to determine what was needed to make sure that um, advanced cutting edge medical innovation in the 21st century um, you know, could get to patients as soon as appropriate. So um, after many hearings and stakeholder input, Congress put in place a number of reforms that I mentioned earlier that provided some flexibility for FDA and more resources and importantly provided FDA with things like streamlined hiring authority so they could hire um, outside of the red tape of the Office of uh, OPM, Office of Personnel Management in the federal government. Those are the kind of tools that I think um, have been examined or are in place. And so I don't worry about FDA keeping pace with innovation. I think that it's important that we all continue to engage with FDA to help and support FDA career scientific staff, but, um, but I'm confident in, in their ability to handle the, the pace of innovation. I want to thank our three fantastic panelists. We wish we could have done this together with you and had a more interactive presentation. But I must say that it's been an eye-opening conversation and I've certainly learned a lot and hope you have as well. After listening to Myla, Joaquin, and Wade, I'm confident that all the people working on innovation in the healthcare space who are relying upon IP as the fuel to support the fire of their great ideas and hard work will be able to beat the COVID-19 challenge and our future health challenges. So on behalf of the IPO Education Foundation, I thank you for tuning in and watching, and I hope you have a chance to see all the other great presentations that make up our virtual 2020 annual dinner. Thank you. IPO Education Foundation events would not be possible without the support of our sponsors and your donations. With your support, we can continue to put on programs and reach more people to educate about the importance of innovation and creation by, within, and for underrepresented communities. Please consider making a donation by selecting the Donate Now button on the website. We greatly appreciate your support.